be a slide of, of a deer. <coughs> there we go. Thank you. Hey, can anybody see that? Can y'all see that? It's uh, <clears throat> two deer looking at each other, and the one on the right says, Bummer of a birthmark, how? And he's got like a target sign on his belt. And I show this because, you know, Pastor Jesse's the one that sent me this last week. And as soon as I saw this, I said, man, this is exactly how I want to conclude our series about being a misfit. Because you're bound to turn with the guy on the left, the deer on the left, has bound to know, like, I'm a misfit because I've been marked. I'm, there's something different about me. And if this is your first time that you've been with us uh, during the series, for the last, including tonight, the last four weeks, we have been in a series entitled Misfits. And kind of like this deer up here, a misfit is, is the oddball out. So you're unique, you're different, you see things differently. You're a, you're a black sheep. You don't, you don't necessarily fit the mold, per se, or the shape into what culture or society has you as. And so as the last several weeks, we've been looking at various men in the book of Acts chapter 8 through 10. And what made these men misfits it's because they thought differently, they spoke differently, they acted differently, they lived differently. That is what made them misfits, all for the sake of Jesus Christ. And so on week one, we looked at Acts chapter 8. And we looked at defining exactly what a misfit is and how God uses misfits to communicate, to engage, to tell his story. We looked in Acts chapter 8 of when God took Philip to Samaria, and then he moved him from Samaria to the desert to tell the good news of Jesus Christ to an Ethiopian eunuch. And then in chapter 9, we look into two different lives, one at one time who was not a follower of Jesus Christ, but who persecuted the church, by the name of Saul, now we know as the Apostle Paul, then we looked at the guy who laid hands on him for his name was Ananias. And so we learned from both of these guys five, specific, five specifically unique principles of what it looks like to be a misfit living. Misfit living, what is this all about? And then last week, we started in chapter 10, verses 1 through 29. Which was very interesting because we saw Peter, who is a Jew, and then we saw Cornelius, this Roman centurion, who is a Gentile. Both worlds collide. They kind of develop and form this relationship. And we learned that a misfit has a change of heart, and they see things differently from what everybody else sees. And then tonight, we're going to continue in chapter 10, verses 30. To 48. And we're going to look at of how they continue on this development of this relationship between these two men. And these two men that you will see in the text, that they understand, they finally understand, let it be known, I'm a misfit. And so tonight, that is the main idea. We're going to be looking at different aspects throughout Scripture. Of what it is, let it be known that we're a misfit. So starting in verses 29 in chapter, chapter 10, verses 29. I gotta get my place right here. New Testament, Acts chapter 10, verses 29. And remember, this is when Peter just came into the household. He's just now starting to realize that God has him going inside of a Gentile's house. And he's just starting to realize that God is breaking down all barriers. And in verse 29, it says, Therefore, I came without objection. As soon as I was sent for, I asked them, For what reason had you sent for me? Verses 30 through 33, it says, So Cornelius said, Four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. At the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. Behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. Your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. 
He is lodging in the house of Simon a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now, therefore, we are present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. So Peter just basically, or Cornelius basically just rehearses his experience with the angel and then tells Peter why he is summoned here to his house. But I want you to know something. If you look in those three verses, notice how you didn't hear that the Gentiles, Cornelius' household, notice how you did not hear that they sat there and they said, yes, tell us all about the Jewish religion. Tell us about all your rules and your regulations. You didn't hear that. What they were learning, what they were yearning for, remember if you look back in verses 2 in chapter 2, there was something missing. There was something missing in Cornelius' life. He was trying to do all of these religious things. Because there was something that was missing. And what was missing is that he understood that he doesn't have the forgiveness of sin. There was something missing. That missing was the element of his relationship with God. And we find that out in verses 14 and chapter 11. That's why Peter was sent to him. And so I just want to stop and pause and ask you this question in all honesty. Have you surrendered your life to Christ? Because in the world that we live in, we're all about gratification. And the, the, the illusion of all of us in this world have this void, have this black hole, whatever you want to call it. And we want to fulfill this black hole, this void with something. And so we go out into the world and we want to gratify. And it works sometimes for a couple hours, sometimes it works for a couple days, sometimes for a couple months, sometimes for a couple years. But then what happens is you fall down and now you need something else to gratify, thinking that it's going to satisfy you. And the only person who can truly satisfy us is Jesus Christ himself. And then when a person places their faith in Jesus Christ of what he has already accomplished on the cross. Amen. For your debt, for your sin. When a person says, yes, Lord, I need you. I have been searching throughout this whole world and I'm not at shalom. I'm not at peace. Because God wired and created us to be in a relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. And I say that because both of these men understood that they were misfits. They understood they were misfits because they understood the faithfulness of God. Peter understood the faithfulness of God because he has seen throughout his years, God has been faithful to him on and on and on and on. Cornelius sees that God is faithful because of the collaboration of the two. God says, hey, I'm going to send you an angel. And she says, hey, I want you to send a message 31 miles away to go get this guy, Peter, from Joppa. Joppa's going to come, or Peter's going to come from Joppa. He's going to give you this message. Peter shows up at his door. Now he is in his house. Cornelius realizes God's faithfulness. So here's the first thing. Let it be known I'm a misfit because a misfit knows the faithfulness of God. He knows. A misfit knows the faithfulness of God. You know, there's a story of a Holocaust survivor. It says, sweeping across Germany at the end of World War II, Allied forces searched farms and houses looking for snipers. At one abandoned house, almost a heap of rubble, searchers with flashlights found their way to the basement. There on the crumbling wall, a victim of the Holocaust had scratched the Star of David. And beneath it, in rough lettering, the message reads, I believe in the sun, even when it does not shine. I believe in love, even when it is not shown. I believe in God, even when he does not speak. Because a misfit knows the faithfulness of God. And if a misfit understands and recognizes and knows the faithfulness of God, a misfit needs to also do what? We need to be faithful. We need to be faithful. And here at Mount Calvary, our purpose is to lead people in an encounter with Jesus Christ and to teach them to be obedient. What it looks like to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And we do that when we brand it by saying to thrive, not just to survive in your relationship, but to thrive in your relationship with Jesus Christ. We have four G's. And we see this in the text. Number one, go to church. Cornelius basically, if you look in verses 24, he invited his family and friends over and says, hey guys, we're preparing for service. We're preparing in an essence for church because we're about to receive a word from God through Peter. 
And one of the ways that God communicates to us is by being and gathering in the house of God. Number two, go to church. Second G is get along with God. We see this in verse 30. It says, Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house. Behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. If you remember last week, remember he was praying at the very same time the Jews were sacrificing the sacrifice in the temple of Jerusalem. Because he knows as a Gentile, you can't go into the temple. So his sacrifice was his prayer to God. And he is praying. He is praying. He is getting alone with God. So go to church, get alone with God. I'll do the fourth one later on. But by getting busy, in verse 25, it says, as Peter was coming in, let me stop there. Cornelius would have been hospitable of letting this Jew in. Hey, sit down, do what you got to do. We want to hear the word of God from you. So he was getting busy. He was being hospitable. So as Peter comes in and Cornelius explains, hey, this is the reason why you are here. We find out from verses 34 through 43 of what Peter has to say. It says, then Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of all. That word, you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism, which John preached. Let me stop there. They were familiar with the ministry of Jesus Christ. They were familiar with John the Baptist. They were familiar with what was going on and taking place. And so he picks up in verse 38 and says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things, which he did both in the land, the Jews, and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and he showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it's by he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and of the dead. To him, all the prophets witnesses that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. The other word for remission is forgiveness. So here's Peter who comes in the house and he gives a very powerful yet simple sermon of the good news of Jesus Christ. But notice in verse 34, this his opening statement is profound. It's profound just this. In fact, this is important because in the statement in verse 34, he says, and Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality for the first time. This household Gentiles hear that God has opened up the kingdom of God. The gift of salvation is to all mankind. And I say that again, just for some fact, it doesn't matter. It does not matter where you've been, what you've done, what you've thought, where you come from. Because God accepts you just the way you are. When you say, yes, Lord, I want your gift of life. I want your gift of salvation. That's when the transformation, the power of Jesus Christ comes in. When you say, yes, I want you to be Lord and Savior of my life. What made Jesus so important was the fact that he was bringing peace. God was bringing peace through his son, Jesus Christ. He was Lord of all. That word peace is shalom. And I've already said this. Every single person who was born by default setting because of our sin, there is, we know that something's missing. And it's that peace that we yearn to be in an intimate fellowship with God. And so God said, okay, I'm going to fix this by sending my son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross so that you would have fellowship, that you would be reconciled, that you would have shalom, that you would have peace, that you would have eternal life. 
that you would have this life that I wired and designed and created you to have. Lord of all, that he is over anything and everything. And then Peter, through 34 through 43, talks about the deity. It's in here, it's in scriptures. The deity meaning that Jesus is God. That Jesus fulfilled the scriptures, he fulfilled the prophecies, that he went to the cross to die for our sins and rose three days later. And that there's witnesses, multiple witnesses, that saw him live. Now when you go to verses 42... There's two words. Preach and teach. Preach is to give a specific geared message. Particular topic. To testify is the other word. And that's got like, if you're looking at a coin, it's, it's two sides to this word. One aspect in this context in verse 42. To testify is to give a warning. Is to give a charge. And if you notice here, Peter gives this warning. It says, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that this is he who was ordained by God to what? To be judge of the living and dead. Folks, there's going to be a day when you're going to go before a holy and righteous God. That should wake some of us up. Because for those of us who have not repented, those of us who have literally rejected at eh, you're, no, I reject you. Are completely separated from God out of the presence of God and live in eternity and in a punishment of the lake of fire. For those of us who say, yes, yes, you are the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. And yes, you have personally died for my sins. But testify on the other flip side is not just a warning and a charge, but to testify is to give evidence. It's to bear witness. And I had the privilege this past Thursday, the director of Billy Graham Association in Maryland, she's been here for a month. She left this past, uh, she left yesterday. She was in my office Thursday and she was telling me the story that because of this flood, and there's some other things that were going on with this couple that this guy literally just went in his life. So he tried to commit suicide by overdosing on a massive amount of pills. And so once the chaplains, once they heard of this, a couple of them went to go minister to the wife and two particular gentlemen went to the hospital down here in Charleston General Hospital. And at first, the guy did not even want to speak to chaplains until one of the chaplains start testifying, start giving his testimony and basically saying, look, I was in your shoes 12 years ago. I wanted to end my life. And this is what God did. And what was amazing is 20 minutes later, not only is the guy hearing this, but he gives his life to the Lord, calls up his wife and says, when I get out of this hospital, when I get recovered, we're going to church. So I say this to say, let it be known I'm a misfit because a misfit knows the power, key word, a misfit knows the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. A misfit knows the power of the gospel. I don't know if you guys ever heard that there's a, uh, there's a, uh, a prayer um, called a prayer for the rattlesnake. And there was a farmer who had three sons, Jim, John, and Sam. No one in the family ever attended church or had time for God. The pastor and the others in the church tried for years to interest the family in things of God to no avail. Then one day, Sam was bitten by a rattlesnake. The doctor was called and did all he could to help Sam, but the outlook for Sam's recovery was bleak, it was dim. So the pastor was called and appraised the situation. He arrived and began to pray as follows. O wise and righteous father, we thank thee that in thy wisdom thou didst send this rattlesnake to bite Sam. He has never been inside the church and is doubtful that he has in all time ever prayed or even acknowledged thy existence. Now we trust that this experience will be a valuable lesson to him and will lead to his genuine repentance. And now, O oh Father, wilt thou send another rattlesnake to bite Jim, and another to bite John, and another really big one to bite the old man? For years we have done everything we know to get them to turn to thee, but all in vain. It seems, therefore, that we all in our combined efforts could not do, this rattlesnake has done. We thus conclude that the only thing that will do this family any real good is rattlesnakes. 
So, Lord, send us bigger and better rattlesnakes. Amen. I say that just like the rattlesnake and the pastor were sent at the right particular time. God will send you to the right particular person at the right particular time to tell them about Jesus. So here's my point. Be prepared. Be prepared to share boldly the gospel to whomever, wherever, whenever. These last couple of weeks with you all, I've given you guys the encouragement and the now what's of what to do. I've taken that personally. So last week we had a couple come in from General Hospital, walked in the interstate, and a friend of mine also, we went past Amma. I'm going to say probably 15, 20 miles past Amma. Because for weeks I've been praying, God, give me an opportunity. I didn't say specifically in Charleston, but God, give me an opportunity. And we had an opportunity to speak about the greatest news that this woman and this guy could ever hear. And then as I'm praying more and more, you guys have already heard me speak. It was amazing because I didn't even think about it. I'm about to leave the office and then Pastor Jesse gives me a call at 4.15 and says, hey, I need you to come down to the office. And it's this woman that I was telling you guys earlier. A 10-minute conversation went into two hours over there in the theater in the 9 a.m. entrance. This woman was <coughs> crying. And she was heartbroken because she knew. She knew that she needed rescue. And she gave her life to the Lord. But we've got to be prepared. Yes, the Spirit of God gives us the word to say. But just like Paul told Timothy, we need to be prepared in season and out of season. We need to be prepared. We have opportunities every single day and every single time. And so as Peter is giving the word of God, as he's giving the truth, as he's going over, in essence, the course essentials of the gospel, look what happens.